one gentleman in the corner. Somebody here? I'm going to make it live because I can't sit here. So all the microphones are going to go hot. Okay. And the gentleman that sent an email again. Uh, the Zoom, it should be live. Uh, the YouTube streaming won't occur until Tech can get here to fix it. I'm going to call the meeting in order. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the Monday, November 6th school committee meeting to order here at the Colbert School. Uh, moving right into the agenda. Um, Public comment. I have a few people in the room or a couple of people in the room. Um, Teresa, can you come to the microphone, please, and state your name. It's on the just a small table. Thank you. There's pictures. Hi. Um, Thank you. Welcome. My name is Teresa Shespansky. I have two children in Braintree Public Schools currently and a third child who will enter BPS in 2025. Um, I would like to speak to uh, standard two on the evaluation rubric, uh, management and operations, pillar 2D, laws, ethics, and policies. Hmm. Last fall, after encouragement from a neighbor to attend a PTO meeting, I found myself sitting at my child's elementary school, shocked and confused at the quality of information being shared with me by Mr. Lee in regards to proposed redistricting in Braintree. Prior to attending that meeting, I had told my neighbors, there's no way that a public school could be making a change like that for the coming school year without communicating with families and detailed planning. Having worked for years in public schools, I had an implicit trust in public school systems. If someone had told me that when if within a few months of that day, I would be filing a legal complaint against the Braintree School Committee, I would have not believed them. As I sat there looking at poor quality slide decks, exhibiting a lack of components required for strategic planning, I raised my hand and asked that the minutes from the task force meetings be released and the actual planning documents be shared with the public. I perhaps naively assumed that these artifacts must exist and that you had assumed that parents were not skilled enough or interested in reading those details. After these materials were released, only after pressure from myself and other families, I found myself again dismayed at the lack of quality and glaring need for the inclusion of someone with expertise in strategic planning and the use of data when creating these types of, these types of plans for any community. I gave you examples from other districts grappling with the same problems as Braintree. I also discovered that the two things that I have repeatedly and consistently asked for, number one, transparency by informing and inviting the public to meetings discussing major initiatives for our schools, and number two, detailed documentation of materials when strategic planning, such as minutes with records of conversations, as well as artifacts used to inform those conversations. They were not just a professional responsibility, they were in fact legally required under open meeting law. On September 11th, 2023, I received a letter from the Office of the Attorney General Division of Open Government, which is public record stating that, quote, following our review, we find that the task force violated the open meeting law as alleged. After reviewing the PowerPoint presentations held on June 6th, September 20th, October 19th, November 9th, and December 12th, we find that none of the presentations contain the required information necessary to serve as minutes under the open meeting law. Although these presentations contain information about topics anticipated for discussion at meetings, they do not record any of the discussions that occurred. Additionally, they do not record any decisions made, votes or actions taken, or a list of documents or exhibits used at the meetings, if any. Therefore, we find that the task force violated the open meeting law. Braintree Public Schools complied with neither the legal nor the ethical guidelines in this work. Again, standard 2D. 
I'd also like to speak to standard one, instructional leadership, in particular 1A, curriculum, 1D, evaluation, and 1E, data-informed decision-making. Due to my shock at the level of professionalism and planning in such an important initiative, I started to pay more attention to the level of planning and materials shared with the public from Braintree Public Schools. I came to the school committee meetings last April and May with the release of the draft of the three-year strategic plan to express my concern about, once again, the lack of any measurable goals in your planning. You published the strategic plan this fall, and in the entire document, I cannot find a single goal that is formulated as a, quote, smart goal, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. On the 1D standard for evaluation, Exemplary superintendents are supposed to model this process through their own evaluation process and goals. Perhaps that's being done now in this process. But this one public document, which should articulate district level goals, pales in comparison to each of the school improvement plans or strategic plans that I can find publicly posted by our neighbors in Quincy or Plymouth. When a leadership organization fails to design SMART goals, which include a path towards achieving these goals, you are left with a list of philosophical statements. Of course, we want all students to be college and career ready. I challenge you to find an educator or a parent who would disagree with these statements. The work of the school system is to stay informed and outline the path to achieving those goals. An example of a specific and measurable task that many districts are engaging in is ensuring that all teachers and children have access to high quality, standards aligned instructional materials. Last spring, I came here and I asked for Braintree Public Schools to make public the curriculum that you are using with our children. I have noticed this fall that the curriculum page on Braintree's accountability site has more information, but it is important to note that in the English language arts, there's not a single resource mentioned that is classified as satisfying college and career readiness standards. Even more distressing, the only curriculum that is listed is Units of Study 2018, it has a failing rating on ed reports, and is listed as only addressing 34 of the 112 foundational skills expected to be taught to students. This is the curriculum stated for fourth in fifth grade currently on our webpage. My daughter enters fourth grade next year. It is incredibly distressing to see how far behind we are in the evidence-based literacy movement. I sat in meetings last year and listened to debates about how to support writing for our middle school students. Yet this is sitting on our website. In Braintree's three-year strategic plan, we have stated under our goal to sustain and refine a challenging and integrated curriculum pre-K to 12, which is aligned with state and national standards and is implemented with sound instructional practices based upon the best research currently available. There is a nationwide reckoning with the importance of using evidence-based literacy instruction. This is a bipartisan movement. 42 states have passed laws making schools legally obligated to use evidence-based literacy instruction. Columbia University has dissolved the program responsible for creating units of study. New York City has admitted the failing of units of study. Former New York City Schools Chancellor Joel Klein has publicly stated that the implementation of this curriculum is one of his biggest regrets. As I've said before, it's not enough to state any goal or ideal. It is our responsibility, it's not mine, I'm not on the leadership team, it's your responsibility as a leadership team to inform yourself of the evidence and put together a specific plan that's aligned with these goals. Currently, the public actions and stated goals are incongruous. Now I see that there's an overview of the ELA curriculum scheduled for tonight. I can only see what I see on the website. So Perhaps there's something already underway towards addressing this. The Mississippi Miracle is a lauded multi-pronged strategy, which includes at its core, the use of high quality instructional materials has led to children in poverty in Mississippi, outperforming their peers across the country on reading tests, including their like peers in the state of Massachusetts. 
In Mississippi, the use of the three queuing strategy, which is promoted in Lucy Culkin's unit of study, is illegal. Students in Mississippi are one of the only a few states nationally to have recovered their pandemic reading proficiency levels, which I know is a topic here. And like Mississippi, like Massachusetts, is a member of the Instructional Materials and Professional Development Network. We'll take a look at the maps on the back. These are facts that leaders of a public school must be acutely aware of and use when strategic planning. This brings me back to 1E, data-informed decision-making, and 1F, student learning. Again, not once in our strategic plan, under any of the teaching and learning objectives, is there listed a time frame? Is there identified a way to measure any of our goals? What does continual improvement mean? We have to have strategies and benchmarks by which to assess progress towards goals. Why is there not listed an action step, time frame, responsible party, or metric with any of these objectives? This work exhibits many of the same mistakes that myself and other community members raised in the materials prepared in the work of the task force. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Chairperson Hager, community members, and members of our Braintree community. My name is Kevin Berner, and I'm here because the school committee is beginning their process to review Superintendent Lee's performance. I've been attempting to reach members of the school committee for some time to share my experience, and I was encouraged to provide public comment here tonight instead. I cannot comment on Superintendent perform Lee's performance as a whole, but I can share an experience I had as a parent of a middle schooler attending Braintree Public Schools. Can I suck it right there? Just for privacy purposes, I just ask you to, I'm not sure what you're gonna say, mm -hmm. but I'm just asking for, for your own personal privacy. Cautious about what you're gonna, you know, what you're gonna be saying, and this is a public meeting. It's recorded. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your concern okay. and response. Our story shares a great deal about Mr. Lee's character and Mr. Lee's judgment. Last fall, my middle schooler was a victim of a disgusting incident of coercion and sexual exploitation from the bully in his grave. We immediately reported the incident to Braintree Police and discussed the incident in detail with our middle school's principal and guidance counselor. A safety plan was developed and an IEP was revised based on our request. School staff assured us that there would be collaboration with the police for the investigation. At that moment, we felt supported by the school. When the police investigation was closed on November 30th, we received a copy of the police report. We were shocked to find no documentation of investigative steps involving the school, or the school staff. We reached out to Superintendent Lee on January 3rd to express our concerns about the lack of school-based investigation or discipline for the bullies. Superintendent Lee met with us about a week later. He expressed some regret over the incident, but declined to comment on whether a school investigation did or would take place. He was dismissive of our request for next steps. This response did not seem consistent with Braintree School's policies around bullying and harassment, or the Massachusetts anti-bullying law. After some additional dead-end correspondence with Braintree School Administrators, we were left with no choice but to file a complaint with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's Problem Resolution System, or DESI-PRS. DESI-PRS gathered documents from us and from Braintree School while conducting their inquiry. On March 29th, DESI-PRS issued a comprehensive 14-page letter of finding that described their transparent review process documents and evidence reviewed, a detailed timeline of events, and their conclusions. The CPRS found Braintree schools in non-compliance, having not followed their own bullying and harassment policies, and having not followed Massachusetts state law. The CPRS ordered several corrective action steps for Braintree schools to fulfill. Superintendent Lee did not inform the Braintree School Committee of the PRS complaint or of the concerning findings. 
We continue to write to Braintree administrators, including Superintendent Lee, regarding our concerns. Most of these messages and requests went unanswered. I attended a Braintree School Committee Policy and Education Subcommittee meeting on May 11th when the PRS letter of finding was discussed. Superintendent Lee described the DESIA letter of finding as, quote, presumptuous and indicated that the district planned to comply with, quote, most of the corrective actions. Characterizing the findings of the state oversight agency's methodical investigation as presumptuous demonstrates a level of recklessness and arrogance that does not belong with the superintendent of any public school system. Planning to comply with only most of the corrective actions places the district in significant legal peril. This made us wonder if this is how Superintendent Lee regards all state or federal oversight and regulations. If so, this is deeply concerning. Because a proper bullying or harassment investigation was never performed, our child is at greater risk of being impacted by fallout from this trauma. We did not ask for this tragedy and approached the school seeking help. We were met with administrators that were preoccupied with protecting their own personal interests and avoiding their ethical and legal obligations. Superintendent Jim Lee had the opportunity to lead with dignity and address the issues according to law and policy, but he chose to diminish our concerns and oversee sham investigations that ignored key facts and evidence. It didn't have to be this way. We don't know why South Middle Principal did not perform the investigations in the fall of 2022, but there was ample time to course correct when we approached Superintendent Lee in January. With an investigation, perhaps we could have learned about the spread and impact of the harassing material. Perhaps children involved could have learned about the harm they caused. Perhaps we could have avoided a lengthy and time-consuming DESI PRS investigation. And perhaps Braintree could have avoided unnecessary expenditures for costly private attorneys that they had to hire to address their mistakes. Superintendent Lee's judgment and actions made a bad situation much worse. Braintree School Administrators broke the law under Superintendent Lee's direction. A superintendent is tasked with making dozens of important decisions every day. I have a limited confidence that the individual who mishandled our straightforward incident will have the capacity to make the hard choices we need to keep our schools safe and make our programs excellent. Desi PRS has to step in when a school district and a school committee has failed to meet their obligations. Here, Superintendent Lee and Braintree Schools failed to meet their obligations. It's the responsibility of the school committee to provide oversight of the superintendent. The school committee has known about these circumstances for months, and the school committee leadership has failed to act. School committee, please don't ask Desi to do your job. The story should alarm every resident in Braintree. What happened to us can happen to any family, and the school committee must act to address Superintendent Lee's mishandling of the incident before another child is harmed. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody online? Has any questions or comments? I think there's one more that's in the back. One more. There are 11 people online, but nobody has a hand up. Okay. So here's his hand in the back. I'm sorry. Back. Oh, Mr. Wells. There's a question today online. John Wells, Regis Road. Um, this complements the first presentation. You're using a discredited, nationally discredited reading program. The K, K to three teachers today were told they're going to continue to use that. So the question I had is, when are you going to discontinue using a nationally discredited reading program? We're having a presentation tonight, so I can't answer that question right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you intend to address it when you're done? Not Probably not this evening, but we will definitely address it. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving into routine matters. Uh, approval of open session minutes from October 2nd, 2023. So moved, Madam Chair. I have a motion by Mr. Devon. Second. A second by Ms. Pablo Mann. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, appro any opposed? As unanimous. Um, moving on to the consideration of approval of the task force minutes. Um, is there any questions or discussion from the committee? A motion to approve. 
So moved, Madam Chair. I have a motion by Mr. Devon. Second. Second by Ms. Pablo Man. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Uh, moving on to communications, um, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. A um, number of things to share with the committee tonight. Uh, first, I want to start, uh, I know it's been done in town already, but I do think it's important to recognize some of our students doing great work, uh, particularly as it relates to the Braintree Police Department and the K-9 kit statue uh, fundraising. Uh, Ella Wood, Gavin Flynn, Marina Whitelaw, and Sophia Whitelaw are all Braintree students. Uh, Connor Flynn, I believe, is a former student. All of these uh, young people were instrumental in putting together and assisting with the uh, dedication around K-9 kids, so we thank them for that. Uh, in addition, uh, thank you. You'll find in your packet a letter to the Quincy Credit Union. Each year, the Quincy Credit Union has stepped up and helped support our new teacher orientation. They, they serve us lunch, and they serve the new folks uh, not only lunch, but a bunch of information about the town of Braintree as they acclimate to a new setting. Uh, this is something, again, they do annually, and we are very, very appreciative of their efforts. Uh, in your packets for your information, you have copies of the policy and ed subcommittee meetings from September 20th, and also copies of the finance and operations subcommittee minutes from September 14th. Uh, another uh, organization that has really stepped up for our students here in Braintree is Cradles to Crayon. Uh, this year, they've donated uh, dozens and dozens of winter coats to be distributed in all of our elementary schools and middle schools and high school. Uh, for those that might need some um, weather protection as the colder weather comes upon us, and we'd like to thank Cradles and Crayons. All those coats are in the process of being distributed at this point. And then lastly, I just uh, wanted to recognize uh, Dr. Gorman Lee, our Social Studies Director, uh, the students, uh, those that um, both were uh, facilitators at the debates held at Branchy High School for both school committee candidates and mayoral candidates, also, those that worked for uh, WAMP TV, uh, it was a wonderful event, informative event, uh, and I'd like to thank all of them for their participation. Any questions or comments from the committee on any of the commendations, communications? I had the opportunity, I'll make this quick, I had an opportunity to go to the um, ceremony for uh, dedication for the Kitts statue. Um, it was a very moving, um, very wonderful, very... Uh, I don't know. It was it was it was a wonderful. I don't know if the mayor would like to speak to it, but it was a a very nice um, presentation. And again, to congratulate those students who who raised money, um, and they were recognized um, very deservedly so at that meeting, uh, at that excuse me at that uh, presentation um, ceremony. And then I also would like to thank um, the Quincy Credit Union for their continued support and a lot of sponsorships for the Brain Two Public Schools. Any other comments, questions? Do you want to say something, Ms. Yeah, just uh, Make up echo, ours. echo the chairperson's uh, comments in regards to what we call the kit kids. Um, kit kids. They came in with a goal um, of uh, memorializing kit and a statue, and they ended up raising $24,000. So really impressive. Uh, they did a nice PowerPoint presentation. Um, just amazing, amazing uh, individuals and um we really appreciate everything that they did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Gifts to schools. As usual, I'm going to read them all, and we'll ask for one motion at the end. Um, Bay State Textiles gifts to schools nine checks totaling $591.90. Braintree High School Project Proof Program. One check in the amount of $2,500 from Joseph Guerrero to be used by the Project Proof Program. South Middle School gifts totaling $13,471.88. One deposit in the amount of 2,976.88 from Haywood Photography. One deposit in the amount of $630 for a grade five field trip. Three deposits totaling $6,780 for a grade six field trip. Three deposits totaling $2,885 for a grade eight field trip. One deposit in the amount of $200 for the SMS play account. East Middle School. $14,507 total gifts to school, one deposit from the grade eight three day for $464, one deposit for the Cougar Palooza fundraiser for $13,908, and the yearbook, um, one deposit for $198. For Ross School, one check in the amount of $1,198.54 from the Ross PTO to purchase nine laminating film and two in-reach staplers. 
And for the Manatequit School Kindergarten Center, one deposit totaling $436 for the street sign raffle. I have a motion to approve the gifts. So move, Madam Chair. I have a motion by Mr. Devon. Second. Oh, sorry. Um, what does the project prove? What is it? Yeah, the program. The, it's a special ed program that's run out of a high school. From... Okay. Okay. So I have, I have a motion by Mr. Devon. Can I have a second from Ms. Ms. Saros? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And of course, that is unanimous. Moving on to trip requests. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. So uh, in your packet, you will find a request for two uh, particular trips. One is a, a repeat performance, I believe, at Pat's Peak, a ski trip for East Middle School students, grades six to eight. Uh, two dates for trips, January 20th and February 3rd, up in Henniker, New Hampshire. I believe this is a trip that's been done in the past. We ask for your approval for this year's. Any questions or comments about the Pat's trips? Quick questions. Uh, man. Thank you. I know a couple of parents have been concerned about the timing of different trips that have come along. So I'm just, the school committee has no say in the date. So we approve the dates that are given, but just to make um, it aware that sometimes there may be conflicts of like graduation or other things going on that people have mentioned. So I just wanted to mention that going forward, we should be cognizant. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Okay. Any other questions or comments about the trips? Motion to accept the path of the trip. So move. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Cobbler Mayor and a second by Mr. Devon. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. <laughs> new York City, that's a new one. So this is a new one. So the New York City music trip, uh, we have Dave Buckley from our music department here to answer any questions that you might have. But uh, again, this is new. Uh, this is a trip of our music uh, students to New York City. Uh, via the company Grand Classroom. Uh, they would see the Broadway show Hates Town, uh, also the New York Philharmonic, um, and uh, a performance clinic with a conductor from the New York Philharmonic as well. Uh, there's also some sightseeing involved. Um, again, uh, Mr. Buckley's here to answer any questions, but uh, it certainly looks like a wonderful trip um, in terms of our students whose passion is music. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions or comments from that sounds like a fabulous trip, a Broadway show and the New York Philharmonic. I mean, find me up. Yeah, it's like a wonderful trip. Yeah. Is this something that you're hoping to do annually? Um, Is this the first time how City it goes? Maybe five years ago. Uh, they do one five years ago. Yeah. Like that. Um, and then, uh, so this is the first time we were actually going to do a Nashville trip um, in March 2020. And then Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we're kind of trying to get back into uh, uh, offering big opportunities for the high school students, the music kids, to see something. I mean, we're just pretty close to an amazing world class city with these uh, you know, Broadway and New York Phil. So, so pretty amazing opportunity. So, um, to just kind of get that. that go. Anybody have any questions or comments? Pretty straightforward. No. Why well, I have a motion to accept. So move, Madam Chair. I have a motion by Mr. Devon and a second by Ms. Cobble Mayor. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Have a wonderful time. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Thank, Thank you. Ms. Thomas. Sorry. Um, going back to Pat's Peak, if you look at it, it says East Middle School. It's actually South Middle School. I know East does it, but this the letter is South Middle. Well, will there be one coming for East as well? There's another one coming from me. Yeah. So the, the title on, on the agenda is wrong. The letter. Okay. The letter is correct. So this one's yeah. for self. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Saros. Okay. We're moving on. Back to the superintendent. Presentation of school and department improvement plans. Okay. Uh, so uh, as was previously mentioned, uh, in the fall, you as a committee uh, voted to approve the strategic plan for the next three years. Uh, as we discussed at that point in time, uh, every year schools and, and our academic departments come up with their own improvement plans that relate directly to the strategic plan. We obviously have representatives from each level here tonight uh, to walk you through the individual plans, which I believe you also have access to in your electronic packet um, that was provided this evening. So we would start with the elementary school and Mr. McDonald from Hollis was the guy who won the contest and got to present. <laughs> First, for being here. Well, first, I want to thank. I want to mention um, 
want to thank our three school queen members that are or in the end of their, their service with us. Um, they, uh, I know it's not your last meeting, but um, we know that uh, we wanted, since we're all here, we wanted to thank you for your service over the years. So Tom Devin, Carlos Saros, Kelly Koblamir, we wanted to thank you guys. I don't think anybody realized how important school committee was until we hit COVID. <laughs> and uh, and uh, just wanted to say thank you from all of us for, for the, the time you spend for the, the kids of Braintree and the, the staff of Braintree as well. The, um, I didn't mean to make it cry. It's <laughs> going to cry in December, too. <laughs> cry, baby. <laughs> so the elementary department plan was uh, collaborated by all the elementary principals. So some of them are here tonight. We have Caitlin Long from Highlands, John Reardon from Morrison, Don Duran from Ross, Tara Boning from Liberty, and Donna Anderson from MSKC. Stacy Soto from Flaherty wasn't able to be here tonight, but... Uh, we all had a hand to play in this plan. We all worked together starting in August and um, have made adjustments over the, the fall to um, put the best plan together we can. As uh, Mr. Lee mentioned, the school, imp school improvement plans and the department improvement plans all derive from our strategic plan, which has three main goal areas, teaching and learning, family and community engagement, and social and emotional learning and wellness. And what we decided as a uh, district was to focus on one objective in each goal area for um, our school improvement plans. So the first objective under uh, teaching and learning is review instructional practices and curriculum to emphasize skills necessary to make sure students are successful in college and career, such as creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. So at the elementary level, we don't talk as much about careers or college placement, but we most definitely talk about critical thinking, creativity, and problem solving. So how do we go about doing that? What's our action plan? Professional development continues to emphasize the curriculum supported workshop model and how it supports differentiated and individualized learning. The workshop model came on several years ago, right before COVID. And one thing about it that I, I, I think we've all seen as principals is how it really lends itself to differentiation and individualized learning. And uh, we've seen that successful. Uh, throughout the school year, the Calkins reading units of study will be fully implemented in the K to four classrooms. We also have in our K to three classrooms, we're implementing foundations curriculum, which is explicit, explicit phonics instructions. Our staff will engage in regular cycles of continuous improvement to review current student achievement data using uh, resources such as Dibbles, which Dibbles is a dynamic indicator of basic early literacy skills star reading and star math, and the MCAS results to adjust instructional groups and determine intervention needs. This is something we're doing consistently at the elementary level, uh, whether it's individual classroom teachers, reading specialists, special educators, getting together, taking data from Dibbles, from star reading, from star math, from MCAS, and developing plans for specific groups of students or individual students to help them be successful. We've also continued the leadership learning and workshop learning walks to collect and analyze data about solid instructional practices and begin to develop methods to triangulate instructional, or instructional practices by expanding the learning walks to faculty members. We've done learning walks at our different schools over the years. We've mostly included um, administrators, but we've talked about possibly bringing teachers into the mix. We were back at Morrison School in late October and uh, it was actually great to get together with the high school and secondary staff to come to Morrison to see what it looks like in an elementary classroom and to see what an elementary teacher does. We're going to go to South, I believe, later this year and also back to the high school, which is another good experience for all of us at the uh, administrative level to see what's happening at the different levels. What are the evidence and matrix? Well, we have Parent Square, which is translatable newsletters. We have the results of the Dibbles 8. I mentioned Dibbles earlier. And the Dibbles 8 has an embedded dyslexia screener, which is really important for us to develop um, practices to help students that are struggling. Every school has what's called RTI, response to intervention. Um, each school does it a little bit differently. Um, but we take the data and we develop RTI groups for students that could be or may not be already recognized for special education services. Um, Phonics instruction, we have in every K through three classroom daily has foundations and Hegarty phonics instructions. We found that to be really beneficial for our students. Um, and we 
it's a, we're able to notice when a student comes from, let's say, a town that doesn't have Hegarty or foundations and how long it takes for them to kind of get into the swing of things because we've started doing this at such a young age and it's really shown a lot of progress. We have inclusive student services, you know, where reading specialists, our math specialists, our special educators come into the classroom and help out. I mentioned the workshop model, obviously, in reading, writing, and math. We've piloted TRAILS, um, which is a social-emotional program that really helps with problem solving at the elementary level. All of our schools have data team meetings um, several times a year where we get together and talk about students. Um, we, we look at the data and we decide to we work together to try to figure out groupings of students to help them um, meet benchmarks. We also have every school calls us something differently. It might be a CCTC, child center team, could be a child study team. Either way, these are groups of people that get together to talk about an individual student who may already be receiving help um, to really figure out a way we can become more um, creative in our thinking and creative and uh, flexible in our thinking to figure out different ways to help students before we recommend them for a special education evaluation. Sometimes the result of a CCT meeting might be, we should do an ev evaluation, excuse me. Other times we decide to do something else. Um, we have our DCAP, which is our District Curriculum Accommodation Plan, which we put together, which has been really helpful. Um, speaking specifically at Hollis for students, I feel like that are leaving Hollis and going to middle school. Um, and I, I wanna mention the, the, the very last thing that's on your thing, the extended school year. Um, the Early Literacy Academy and the EL program over the summer. We've always had in Braintree special education services for students who qualified, but in the last several years, we've adopted an EL program over the summer for students whose native language is not English. And we've also started an early learning, early literacy academy. Based on students' test scores in June, the district has taken students who we think may be, may, may be struggling when the school year starts and have them come. Two years ago, the program was at Hollis. Last year was at Flaherty for approximately a week during the summer, um, right at the end of August, to really get them ready for um, for the expectations that we're gonna have when school year starts. And I think that's really the two important programs that have helped help our students be successful. The next goal area is family and community engagement, which is increasing opportunities to engage families with the community and the community with our schools. Obviously we utilize Parent Square. Can't, we can't stress the importance of Parent Square, um, not just for the messages that we send out about the Red Sox day or library books being overdue, but the fact that Parent Square is translatable and it's able to reach all of our families in their native languages, which is really important. We also make sure we improve the communication between the home and school during critical transition years, whether it's pre-K to kindergarten, kindergarten to first, or grade four to grade five, and providing updates to the greater um, Braintree community. Our evidence is the attendance at our PTO meetings, and some schools do coffee chats as well. Also the attendance we have at our parent-teacher conferences. This year, we're going to provide at least one night where it is virtual. We have our school advisory board. School advisory, as some of you probably already know, school advisory is um, a, a representative from each school's PTO. We'll go to the school advisory and share best practices of the PTOs so that Liberty can hear what Morrison is doing and is doing and Highlands can hear what's successful at Ross and then possibly bring those initiatives back to their home school. We have our school councils, which meet and review things like the school improvement plan. Speaking specifically for Hollis, our school council gets together and we try to come up with at least one project per year to benefit our school. It might be to develop a, um, to have a, um, a lending free library outside the school. It might be to develop a, re a reading room. It might be to survey the, 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 the school about the readathon or dress code, um, all those different things. We also have many family and community activities and EL night. Um, Title I night for schools that have Title I services and math and literacy nights. The math and literacy nights are really important, especially this day and age when um, math instruction is a lot different than it was for parents who are home trying to help their kids. So having these math nights have been really helpful to explain to parents what a number, what a hundreds chart is and what a 10 frame is so they can use those tools with their child when they're at home. And then of course I mentioned Parent Square being translatable and then also having online resources and forms for families online for them to look at, especially when they're registering their children over the summer. And our last area is social emotional, and that is to continue to develop and enhance the integration of district-wide 
social emotional learning and wellness programming to provide students with the appropriate skills to make effective decisions regarding conflict resolution, bullying, social media, and social pressures at all content areas and all grade levels. Really, one thing we're talking about a lot at our level is to maintain, making sure we're maintaining an environment where everyone feels accepted, diverse with backgrounds and identities, the strengths or challenges are respected, affirmed, and celebrated. And they're honored by ensuring equitable and culturally responsive teaching and learning. And what we're going to do this year, we, we talked about developing at least one event per school where the purpose is to bring the school community together to celebrate its diversity. We've already planned something where all six, seven schools go to town hall in March and have kind of like a diversity night where students can come in, in their native um, dress, um, perform, possibly have food as well um, at town hall in March. So we're looking forward to that. Other evidence and matrix and metrics are classroom libraries are culture responsive. Uh, there's no doubt about that, especially with um, the workshop, the tools bring coming in from the workshop model. Um, work of the DEI committees and libraries. Most of our DEI um, programs at our schools have developed libraries for students to uh, teachers to use for students. Um, hosting cultural arts programming that promote inclusivity, embed opportunities for sharing cultural responsiveness, whether it's through holiday announcements or world language announcements. All of our schools set up displays and bulletin boards to, to promote um, inclusivity and diversity, and then having links to instructional holiday videos. This is like a, a breathing document. It's not just, it, it, it changes. And one thing I wanted to add to this, just off the top of my head, was all of our schools as well, when it comes to social emotional learning, have either school-wide or classroom-based um, exercises that are done, whether it's yoga, whether it's breathing. As a school at Hollis, every morning we take three deep breaths together. Um, to um, and have one theme. This, the, the theme this month is gratitude. Um, but every many classrooms across the district do this, really teaching children to take a step back, take some deep breaths, think about the situation, process it, and how they would act from there. So again, this is a collection of, of all of us, and I just wanted to uh, share with you tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Continue. Any questions for the entry? No? Excellent. Oh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thorough presentation. Yeah. Uh, next up, representing the middle schools, is uh, Principal John Chan from East. Good evening, everyone. So, so let me start by saying this. This morning, when I got up, put my clothes on, and I took my suit jacket, and I put it in the car, so I wear it when I got to the meeting tonight. Got in the parking lot, pulled out, and I put it on. I could barely put my arms through it because it was my son. So I apologize for. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. It's funny. Yeah. Um, so my name is uh, John Shi, and I am the principal at East Middle School. I am representing both East and South tonight, as Mr. Rainey had a prior commitment. So he apologizes he couldn't be here. Uh, we did not write this together, but I would also like to thank our three outgoing school committee uh, members for their extraordinary efforts, I know, and for their commitment to the students of Braintree. Um, I've had the good fortune of getting to know each of you um, uh, in more personal capacity than uh, most community members just watching the broadcast. Whether we were navigating the unknown waters of COVID, representing Braintree on major school building projects, or being fiscally responsible during the collective bargaining process while balancing your support for students and staff. You each in your own way brought value to this board. Most importantly, always put the students first. So thank you for your service to this community. Thank you. You guys are worth it. So the development of um, these plans um, was a collaborative process driven by the desire of the Braintree Public Schools leadership team to embrace a common mission and to move forward by focusing on our agreed upon district goals. Uh, many of the things I'll say tonight are very similar to what Tim uh, said. So there's three goals are in the areas of teaching and learning, family and community engagement and social emotional learning and wellness. The first uh, objective and goal area one is the ongoing review of instructional practices and curriculum to emphasize the skills necessary for students to be successful in college and career, such as creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. As such, we plan at the middle level to analyze assessment and grading practices to ensure coursework aligns with content and grade level standards. 
We plan to provide appropriate enrichment and our support for students at all levels of achievement. And like every other uh, level in the district, the middle level will continue to participate in our district-wide learning walks to help analyze and improve instruction across the district. Our hope is to begin including teachers in this initiative as well. Some of the evidence and metrics of this uh, plan, your agendas and materials, faculty meeting agendas, grade distributions being reviewed by administrative team each term, ED, uh, workshop model, reading, writing, math in, uh, in grades five, our DCAP, uh, district curriculum accommodation plan, curriculum guides and pacing guides. Uh, in goal area two, the objective is to increase opportunities to engage families and the community with the schools. This year, our plan is to develop, to develop parent and family orientation and resources uh, to support families using the tools available to them. Resources such as Aspen, Parent Square, Google Classroom. Uh, these are really great tools, but I don't think all of our parents know how to use them. I can tell you uh, from experience, I sit with many parents, walking them through Aspen, talking to them about uh, Google Classroom. It's great that kids are able to access Google Classroom and see what their assignments are, but a lot of the parents don't really understand the, the tool itself. And uh, so we need to do a better job of educating parents on how to use these tools. And as Tim said, Parent Square is such a great uh, communication tool, most importantly because of its ability to translate. Uh, and the, So we'll continue to... Um, to develop those resources for parents. Building administrators and directors will be working with teachers to develop assignments and experiences which allow families to more actively engage in the student learning. And we're also committed to planning more activities for meet and greets such as coffee times and student showcases during the school day and not just during uh, school hours. We wanna invite families into the building. Some of the evidence of that uh, work will be uh, will be our PTO meetings, parent-teacher conferences online and in-person, parent square emails, texts, newsletters, uh, online resources, forms, uh, and other um, resources for families. And uh, a goal area three is a focus on social emotional learning and wellness. The district will continue to develop and enhance the integration of social emotional learning and wellness programming that provides students with the appropriate skills needed to make effective decisions regarding conflict resolution, bullying, social media, and social pressures. This year at East, we are expanding our use of the trails curriculum uh, to our students in grade six. At South Trails, lessons are beginning to be implemented in grade five. We started that last year. Uh, it was a very successful um, model. We are also introducing the idea of using restorative practices when dealing with conflict, bullying, social media, social pressures. At the middle level, we have identified the need for including restorative practices in combination with traditional consequences. The intention is to shift the focus of student discipline from punishment alone to reflective learning, emphasizing accountability, making amends, facilitating dialogue between affected parties. We've already begun implementing, uh, creating implementation teams, attending professional development opportunities, and working with um, district connected organizations such as essential partners to strengthen our support for students and improve the overall school culture. Our school improvement plans, all of these plans are tied to our identified district goals, which were developed collaboratively with a focus on achieving the mission of the Braintree Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from middle school? Sure. Mr. Sheehan, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, just a quick question. Train the trainer. We're train the trainer. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you guys going with that? So the trails curriculum itself uh, was brought in, uh, and our, our guidance department uh, actually took the lead on training our fifth grade teachers on how to implement. So it's really training the actual teachers, the boots on the ground that are that are training our kids. So that's that train the trainer model. So bring someone in to step back. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Shane. Thank you, Mr. Chan. Next up from Braintree High School, we have Dr. Scully. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, my fellow principals have said a lot of what I intend to say. I mean, of course, Mr. Sheehan talking about his absence as of a jacket before I had a chance to pick on him about it. But 
Um, but also uh, recognizing the, the school committee members who will be wrapping up their service. Each of you have been um, real supporters of the high school. And so I feel personally sort of uh, supported um, in a number of ways over the last uh, several years. So thank you from the high school and personally. Um, the structure of the plans has been discussed tonight. I won't go through all of that stuff, but um, I would like to just highlight a few items, uh, a few action items that we have at the high school. So starting with the first goal area of curriculum instruction assessment and thinking in particular about um, career education. Um, one of the things that we've tried, we've been trying to focus on at the high school is making sure that our students are not only concentrating on how to succeed within the walls of Braintree High School, but also thinking about what happens outside those walls, because we have them for 12, 13, 14 years, depending on uh, when they start in Braintree, but then they move on. And so we want to make sure that they're ready for that. So a few of the items I just want to point out, uh, item number three under this area was to formalize or is to formalize the BHS career fairs. And I want to point out the healthcare uh, fair. We, we have two primarily that we've been working on. One is through the trades, which Mayor Kikoris has helped us set up and put us in contact with a number of folks uh, who come and talk to our students about the various apprenticeships and training programs. But also we've started a nice partnership with South Shore Health and um, they've run a couple healthcare career fairs for us in the recent past. They're going to run one this spring. And in fact, uh, based on how we did last year, we're actually working out a plan where we're gonna be able to host um, small groups of students from other high schools because they want to expand it and they liked how we were able to do that. So uh, I'll be visiting one with the with our contact later this week just to see how that's done hosting other schools. So we're excited to be able to offer that to our students. And it actually expands because it grows and she brings more presenters. It actually expands the opportunities for our students by growing it um, so that it works both ways. And then the last item, um, Veteran members of this group have known that I've talked about getting a DECA chapter for uh, a couple of years, and I'm happy to say that this fall, um, our DECA chapter was officially recognized by the state organization, and they are currently making plans to attend a conference and competition later in the year, so that's really finally starting to take off. Um, we've been supported by some grant funding for that, and there's some real support. The DECA folks from the state came and they stayed the entire day. They spoke to all of the business classes this semester to try and sort of explain to them. So that's starting to take off. Uh, and then one item that's not on here, but it's related to the career fairs is that uh, we are working on, we received an Innovation Career Pathways planning grant. There's a lot that's involved in that. Um, that's something down the road, but generally we are looking at whether it's supported by that state funds or not. We're looking at trying to formalize ways to introduce students to different career possibilities. So that's not in this plan. That's more something that you may see in the future, but it's related to generally trying to give our students resources to think about what's next. Uh, in the second category, family and community engagement. Uh, again, I'd like to point out um, two uh, for you. One is to engage families and community in vision of the graduate process. That's something that we worked on last year. We're just really getting back to here in the fall. Um, the vision of the graduate is uh, hopefully at its conclusion, a document that speaks for the entire district, but also the high school in particular, and talks about what is it that we want our students to be able to do when they finish in that time. Uh, we know they're moving on to other things. Um, at Braintree High, we send approximately 90% of students on to some sort of higher education every year. So obviously being prepared to be a college student is an important part of that. But also what do we want besides being able to take notes and do your homework. You know, what are the what are the skills and the habits of thought that we want them to be able to do? So we started with a smaller group last year. Uh, we brought their work to our faculty earlier in the year at a professional day to get their feedback. We have, um, we sent a survey out through Parent Square that you've heard mentioned a couple of times to get some feedback from parents. We have some ongoing work with that committee uh, this week, later in the month. And at some point we would bring to the, the broader communication or the broader uh, community sort of here some ideas that we think. So that's ongoing through the year. And then just the last item that I wanna to point to is we've had some good conversations about expanding and formalizing our senior day of service. That's something that we initiated last year, really did for the first time. And um, 
We were happy with the enthusiasm. We were happy with many of the projects that the seniors um, engaged in, and we're looking for ways to make that um, even more streamlined for them to get involved with and even more supported so that we know um, everybody can find something to do. And if, if just to, to review, that's something that we built into the end of the year for seniors, and we encourage them to look for a service project that they would like to get involved with one day. It's everything from um, some people had sort of cleaning areas of their neighborhood all the way to we had a couple students head over, I think over to East, uh, to the phys ed department and uh, spend the day sort of not only assisting teachers, but also just talking to students a little bit. And, you know, if a 12th grader comes back and you're, uh, you know, a fifth, sixth or seventh grader, that's, you know, yeah, it's like a celebrity, right? So, um, so we were able to start that and we're looking, we've been talking to um, student council and to some other organizations at the school, student organizations for how we can formalize it and expand it. And then finally, in the last category, um, social and emotional learning, um, there's a lot that, that we do at the school and there's a lot that takes place through um, various departments and through various clubs and organizations. Uh, School-based, I'll just point out two. One is to fully implement our pilot student support team meetings. That's something that you've probably heard about a lot at the earlier grade levels. And it's something that our guidance department is trying to bring to the high school. Um, you're all aware that we have a house system. We try to take a bigger school and divide it into a smaller community. And that process brings together different professionals in the building um, to try and put your heads together when a student may be struggling and requires support, not just academically, not just uh, emotionally, but sort of some combination of everything. And so uh, something that we started last year as an attempt to sort of see if it would work at our level. We had some good feedback from everybody involved and we want to actually grow that and make it a regular occurrence this year. And then just the last item, which many of you have probably heard about already, we have, uh, it's called in this document, a new cell phone policy. It's actually really a different way of thinking about what is our same policy that, that has not changed in our student handbook but as a, way to, um, as a way to support our students who perhaps struggled with that at times. Uh, our classrooms have cell phone holders um, and we're working so that students can basically park their cell phone there, they conduct class, and then they grab it on the way out. I know that this is a topic that uh, just this week has been in national newspapers about um, the wide range of approaches that schools have taken. We've tried to take a targeted approach you know, as with any technology, it's in how you use it. Um, you know, we're not sort of, uh, we're not trying to take uh, cell phones and and beat them with hammers and sort of bring us all back to a pre-smartphone era, but instead we want to encourage intelligent use. So uh, we've avoided that distraction in class because that's our focus, but students can still use them in studies and lunch before and after school. Uh, we're just trying to aid uh, students and teachers. So those are some of the items that it, there are others in there that um, that we could go into more detail with, but that's an overview of what we're working on this year at the high school. Thanks. Okay, any questions or comments? There. there. Um, I, currently I have two kids in middle school and I was able to download going on the objective too. I was able to download the schedule for the year, all field trips, any like any event that's going on at South middle yeah. downloaded on my phone, like, we do for kids sports. Is that for all the schools or was it just like so? Like I clicked on a link and it downloaded every event into the calendar. Um, I, I don't know that particular link on the website. I would have to look into it. I don't know that we have a, um, a quick step for that. I think part of the issue is the same thing that we run into with um, parent teacher organizations at the high school is that um, there's a lot going on at the high school. So if, yeah. if you had every event, um, you know, you might not see your own event. So one thing that we try to do is every Friday, we put out a Friday update. Um, some of you have seen it. What that does is it looks retrospectively at a few highlights um, from the last week, but also at right underneath the introduction for me, there's a list of the next, say, three to four weeks at a glance. Um, so you can right now see all of November events that we think are relevant for families um, because not all the events are relevant to everybody. We have a lot of athletic events, so there are different places to go. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Devin? Uh, I'm very encouraged to hear about 
So we say trying to morph the cell phone policy. Uh, Madam Chair, you and I will probably remember when we first got on this committee so many years ago. You got on, you were quite a bit younger than me. Um, but technology was something that was not uh, laptops, not every student had. And we've seen it progress to a point we know that there's a capacity for some real good with this and some real bad. I think our cell phones are the same way. I deal with plenty of tradesmen and all the different um, um, uh, uh, trades out there and how they utilize them vastly differently based on what they're trying to accomplish. I think that they, there should be some more, shall we say, uh, targeted discussions as to how they can be used to uh, uh, encourage them to, shall we say, uh, everything from learn with it to socialize in a more proper way. I think that it just, it's an opportunity that we, I see up there. I look forward to what it's gonna be like in a few years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Mr. Chair. Yeah, just to piggyback off that. I just kind of want to see at the end of the year, how that goes, teacher feedback. Hope yeah, you know it in the schools. happy to. One of the things, just on that item, uh, one of the things that we did over the last two weeks um, was we brought uh, faculty that was interested in offering us feedback and how it was going in their classrooms. We brought them together to meet after school. We have um, a couple of other faculty members who have facilitated our feedback sessions in the spring. And um, they sat, they gathered that feedback and they're preparing right now a communication back to the staff to say, here's what we heard that was working. Here's what you know we, we think we need to step up on. Um, and they were useful. A couple faculty members spoke at our opening faculty meeting and then sort of came back and had a couple sessions afterwards to say, for instance, that particular technique that we're talking about with the holders, a number, well, I shouldn't say a number, a, a handful of teachers were using already. And so we heard from them for like, hey, here are some tips. So I anticipate that um, like anything else, we're probably gonna have to revisit it a few times over the year and say, hey, remember this is what we're trying to do and this is why and be happy to come back and talk about it. Yeah, I think it's important parents back you guys up on that because it's difficult for teachers to have phones like that. So I think you're on the right step. I don't just said a hard process. So we'll see how it goes. And, and anecdotally, the assistant principals tell me they've had um, really strong support from families. Um, so that's been that's been very helpful. Great. Um, could I ask uh, if you could include the school committee on your Friday updates on Parent Square at the uh, the elementary schools and. Uh, Oh, sure. Share their like weekly updates with us. And I found it very helpful as I don't have a child at high school and it, it kind of lets you know what's going on. I thought that was in the distribution list. So I apologize. I'll add that. I'll add that to those. Thank you. I think we have to add, be added separately. Is that? Yeah, to be added separately. Yeah. Okay. School it. committee members is the, the link you're looking for. Oh, we'll send it. It's coming soon. We look forward to it. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, I think that there's a lot of great work being done at the high school. I you know, had the uh, pleasure of being the, um, the school council and the vision of the graduate subcommittee. So I feel like I, you know, I'm, I'm really in the know there. And it really is great that um, the programs that they're doing for um, my son went to um, Emanuel College last week for the field trip and they got to talk to people that were in accounting and business world and all that kind of stuff. And um, I think that's a great opportunity. I'd love to see more of those things happening, those field trips so kids get out into the career uh, field and you know see what's going on. Um, so I think that was a great opportunity and uh, thank you. Thanks. You need something for the trades as well, right? You bring in a- Yes, so uh, we've, we've done that and that has representations I want to say you've been there, of course, uh, 10 to 12 different trades, um, you know, really sort of who are, you know, tell us that they are looking for what students or young adults to join, you know, to sort of, you know, to enter the apprenticeship program. So um, they've been great partners. We're doing that again this year. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again. All right. So last up, um, very similar to all the, the buildings, uh, each one of our departments also puts together an improvement plan. Um, so we had the opportunity to roll out about 15 other members to come and tell you about their plans, or we could consolidate it into one and ask Ms. Fernaza to do it. So we went with the option two. Uh, and so Ms. Fernaza. 
So yeah, I, uh, the principals have touched on what the process was, uh, but just so that you're aware, um, the entire leadership team did a deep dive into student data. We looked at assessments, subgroup data, special education, ELE, attendance, discipline, transfers, um, and more. I think it was 80 pages of um, data before we started the work of creating um, our action steps um, and objectives. Additionally, we reviewed the strategic plan um, document to make sure that we had everything we needed in order to follow a plan moving forward. We created action steps for each element of the plan by department and grade level. Um, and we reviewed the district-wide focus areas to connect them so that each um, grade level at school-based and department had were aligned in their thinking and action steps. Um, so as you saw from the, the plans, they are meaty um, and um, to have each department go through all of their priorities would have taken a very long time. So um, I just pulled out a few things from each department so that you could get a sense of some of the focus areas. Um, as we've already said, these are the three district-wide objectives. Um, and as you saw from the elementary, middle, and high school, these were the, the three areas that we created action steps from. Um, so in art and design, there she is, or they, sorry, are focusing on supporting teachers as they explore ways to incorporate social, emotional, wellness expression into the curriculum and practices. In social studies, they will review curriculum unit guides to increase, expand learning standards, focusing on various cultures and perspectives, identify areas across the K-12 curriculum to create opportunities to discuss college and career opportunities in the field of social studies, historian, anthropologist, psychologist, sociologist, geographer, cartographer, et cetera, cartographer, um, create opportunities to engage students with town officials and agencies in social studies classes. In English and reading, collaborate with district ELA teachers to improve, improve the vertical alignment of curriculum, contribute to the district's updates for families with information about literacy and ELA, develop more interdisciplinary opportunities that allow students to see the connection between literature, history, national identity, and citizenship, and collaborate with and support teachers as they pair text to increase exposure to different perspectives. In math, eliminate deficit thinking in language and increase growth mindset, language, and practices. Continue to explore student-centered math resources to support teaching in a math workshop model with a focus on context by learning units by Kathy Fosnott and building fact fluency for addition and subtraction, multiplication, and division by Graham Fletcher and Tracy Sager. Create a parent advisory board for the calculus project. Integrate activities that teach students responsible use of digital resources into the middle school math classroom. I know this is fast. Um, you guys have these in your packets, but um, and you have the whole plans if you really want to dig in. Um, science, support and facilitate professional development related to applying the claim evidence reasoning structure into science assignments and assessments in grades 2 to 12 in order to deepen the level of critical thinking. Collaborate with science teachers working to increase student collaboration through use of modeling, pedagogy, and making relevant connections. And provide resources and support for science and elementary media teachers as they work to support students facing personal, social, and or emotional challenges. In music, invite parents to collaborate with staff for festival concerts and events within the music department. And director will continue to analyze data to identify the needs of the students. In ELE, um, collaborate with teachers in developing lessons and activities that will engage all learners towards increasing academic language proficiencies. Continue to work with staff in promoting, increasing, and encouraging family and community engagement through communications and involvement in school and district activities. Support teachers in developing an asset-based approach in building community within the classroom where all students feel valued and have opportunities to contribute their own funds of knowledge to the learning process. In world language, provide opportunities for students in grades 11 and 12 to qualify for the Massachusetts Seal of Biliteracy. Continue to support teachers to establish class environments that support student collaboration and reinforce skills related to effective decision-making and conflict resolution. In guidance, Support departmental efforts to create more student-centered classrooms and instructional practices by expanding opportunities to share through curriculum and instruction sidebars during faculty meetings, assist with the creation of a study skills course for students, work collaboratively with academic departments to develop consistent and clear messaging for parents and students. Health and wellness continue to implement strategies to increase student engagement as a means of increasing growth and achievement of all students. Director and teachers will continue to implement social emotional learning components into their curriculum. 
nursing, provide health education and interventions aimed at maintaining students' overall health and wellness, thereby limiting absences, improved attendance, enhance the students' exposure to creative creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. Continue to provide resources and support to nurses to help them develop and implement healthcare interventions that meet the diverse needs of all students. In special services, enhance professional development offerings to special education and general education staff to support understanding of special education policies and procedures and best practices for supporting learning. Continue partnership of community businesses, agencies, and organizations that support our students who receive special education services until age 22. Support staff through structured program meetings and evaluation in establishing clear expectations and structured class environments that support student collaboration and reinforce social school skills that support effective decision making. So that, <laughs> um, that is some some blur, um, bullets from each the um, from each department. Um, the schools have the added bonus of getting to um, use these highlights within their schools on top of the improvement plans that they've created. So obviously every department um, is in every school. Um, so all of those bullets are doubly impactful. Any questions from the committee? Comments? Seeing none. That's, a, that's all the plans we got. Comments? Do you, you have anything you want to add, Mr. Lee? No, I, I think what you see is the work that's been done since um, the end of last school year. As we took a look at the strategic plan, as we collected all the data we wanted to assess, uh, we had retreats over the summer where, as Ms. Renaza mentioned, we poured through 80 pages of data in all types of categories to find out where are our students doing well, where are our students doing poorly. And these plans emerge from those conversations and those discussions. So uh, we'll come back to you uh, in, with the end of the year reports in terms of how successful we think we've been in terms of some of this um, planning. Um, but obviously the, you know, the individuals who are here tonight and those that couldn't be here have worked diligently to put together you know, plans that support our priorities as we enter into the school year. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the presentations. Thank you for your work on behalf of all of our students. You're very much appreciated. Um, you're more than welcome to stay for the remainder of our agenda, which is quite lengthy, or you may be dismissed if you so choose. So thank you all hours again for being here. Quite right. Yeah. Yes. She might need to find his coat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Great seeing you guys. Moving on to the presentation of the K3 reading program. Give me a second for the slides to load. Part of us. Okay. Uh, so uh, for those who have interest, if you're following news recently over the course of the last couple of years, the conversations around reading and literacy have, have really blown back up. Um, a lot of information coming out from various parties. Uh, as was previously mentioned, there was a separation of Lucy Calkins from the Columbia Teachers College and what the implications of that might be. So you know, I've asked Ms. Gennaro, who is our director of ELA, and Danielle Romero, um, Romeo, who is our literacy coordinator down in the elementary schools, to come and give a, an overview to the committee of what is it we're actually doing, so you have an understanding of that. I think what you'll find in the presentation is uh, what that looks like is, um, as it relates to student performance. Uh, and where we see this going in the future. Um, what you can also find, I think I sent you each the link, is um, Ms. Gennaro has updated our, our website. It has all the information that you'll see here tonight and more. Um, but again, we can't start a conversation without some good information. So, Ms. Gennaro. Thanks. Um, Dr. Gennaro, my apologies. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say um, publicly that it, it's been a wonderful um, few months as I've arrived here in Braintree. Um, I've had an opportunity to get into most of the um, 86 
elementary classrooms and 42 of, of the English classrooms at three of the schools. And I've been very impressed with what I've seen, um, both from the teachers and from our students. We have some very hardworking um, young people that are, are very impressive. So what I'd like to do tonight is give you an overview of what we're using at the um, various levels, and then also to share with you some of the um, materials, the data, and then room um, as we see it for strengths and, and room for growth as well. Um, so the first slide, if you would, Mr. Lee. So, um, Braintree chooses a comprehensive approach to literacy. Um, it includes early and explicit foundations in the instruction of phonological awareness. Um, students gain a competency and a confidence as they progress through vertically articulated curriculum, meaning that we're working very hard to make sure that the looping um, from grade to grade is um, logical. Uh, for our students, it's linked to Massachusetts state frameworks for reading, writing, listening, speaking. Students will um, work to become effective writers in a variety of genres, including expository, persuasive, informational, and analytical. They can understand as readers, analyze, and critically think about a variety of texts. And near and dear to my heart is that students create um, for themselves through engaging text, a love of learning, something that we want our students to do throughout their lives, to read um, things that interest them, things that enrich their lives and enhance their ability um, to, to serve as, as citizens. So our approach um, for learning includes um, some of the things that have already been mentioned by Principal McDonald, and that includes the use of Hegarty um, for our younger students for phonemic awareness, foundations as a word study program, and also um, in the foundations, it's focuses on rhyming, syllable blending, uh, syllable segmenting, and phoneme manipulation. So there is a a very strong cognitive science-based approach to how our students are um, learning to read. Students in K to five um, also use units of study as already been mentioned. Um, and the uh, libraries for those are very rich, engaging and diverse texts for students um, to develop their fluency and their comprehension skills in reading. Um, Mr. Lee mentioned the website. I would turn your attention at some point when you've got a few extra minutes to jump on to BPS um, website to look under academics and then under um, English language arts. That was one of the first things that um, I felt was a priority when I arrived in September to be able to have a user-friendly, parent-friendly resource for um, our families to be able to look at what we're doing in a comprehensive approach to literacy and be able to find resources to use at home to be able to also enhance. It's very important to us that reading is a partnership and a conversation. Um, and so our website hopes to, to provide those resources for families. Don't look at six to 12 yet, it's a work in progress. And um, hopefully I'll be able to come back in a few months and um, speak to you about six to 12 looking is stunning. Um, our assessment tools for mentioning, um, as Tim mentioned already, we do use Dibbles um, and it is Dibbles 8 K to 3 for early literacy components. We use Dibbles with our um, kindergarten students in the middle of the year. And the end of the year, we used something called QPASS at the beginning of the year this year. It allowed us to delve a little bit deeper into our youngest readers. Um, first grade, second grade uses it three times a year for benchmarks for beginning of the year, uh, middle of the year, end of the year. Third grade is using it at the beginning of the year. And any students who are in need of strategic invent, uh, interventions, um, are, are then um, flagged for that and are receiving those interventions. Um, and that falls within the state mandates 
for dyslexia. So we're in compliance with that. Our STAR reading program is grades three to five, and that helps us to um, be able to have some indicators three times a year as well as to student progress. It also helps us to, it does align with the MCAS, so it also helps us to be able to um, really target some of the standards for MCAS to see where students are, what the needs may be. Um, and then of course MCAS, which we'll dig into a little bit more deeply um, later on. So for data, because it is an implementation process, um, the data that we have is still data that's being um, developed. Um, we, we had certain grades implement um, the workshop model early on. We had early adopters, various um, schools. And so now is the first full year of implementation. That's when we're looking at district-wide data and really being able to kind of get that foundation of, okay, what is working, what isn't working, what needs tweaks. Um, as we're looking at the dibbles, one of the things that I want to call to your attention, um, some really great news for, with the dibbles. So if you're looking at this for our current third graders, at the start of the year, we're noticing that the um, summer slide, the retention of students as they are um, testing at the beginning of the year, that that summer slide is lessening um, as we go. And we hope that that's a, a, a reflection of, of the work that they're doing um, in all of these multiple comprehensive layers. We also look to across um, at the reduced need for interventions. Um, one of the large um, indicators for a national success in reading, one of the things that has gained some attention has been a, a statistic that um, has is questionable, but that 30, that excuse me, that 75% of third graders are not reading at grade level. Um, and what I want you to understand walking away from this presentation is that at the beginning of this year, already 75% of our Braintree students are already reading at grade level, which is wonderful news. Um, for our STAR, um, again, significant gains at the beginning of the year. Um, for STAR compared with last year. What you have here is a chart for all of our schools. This is the scale score. It's on a 1400 point um, <clears throat> scale, corresponding percentile ranks, which aren't seen here, derive the cut scores that would serve as proficiency benchmarks. A percentile of 40% or higher like, is an indicator that at the end of the year, students will meet performance goals as defined by state standards. And our great news, um, in addition to all of those wonderful pluses in that, that um, far right column, indicate that all of our schools are on track to meet the end of year um, benchmarks for reading. So that's terrific news. Um, MCAS. So I think that you've looked at MCAS. Um, previously, uh, last month at the meeting, and as more of the, I think it, the original um, meeting that you had was just after the scores had come out, so we're, we've certainly got more data on that. Um, the good thing about looking at this, I did a little bit of cross-cutting with the data, and I cross-cut it by looking at not only at English, but also at math and at science. And I was looking at word problems and I was looking at opportunities for students to write across disciplines. And what I found was, was really encouraging that there are transferable skills for students that they scored quite um, well, particularly our science scores were, were really wonderful, particularly in the writing. So what that tells me is that students are able to read to translate what they're reading into a question and then to translate that into writing that demonstrates their understanding. So that's a really important transferable skill that our students are, are um, doing quite well with. I wanna return to the MCAS um, a little bit later on in the presentation. Specifically in terms of elementary um, uh, literacy and our approach 
Um, one of the things that I've been very grateful for this year is the addition of the literacy coordinator position and Danielle Romeo. Um, if you have not met Danielle, she is my um, uh, she's my left hand tonight, but she is my right hand person. Um, she's been instrumental in being able to um, get into the classrooms, get into the schools and provide for teachers a lot of the support that they need around the implementation. Um, it's always daunting taking on a new program. Um, and I think having someone as a resource in the district to be able to be that hands-on, been there, done that, right here with you kind of coach has really started to make a positive change. Um, we've heard great things from, from teachers um, as far as levels of satisfaction feeling like they're heard and supported. Danielle has done a great job with pacing guides, which also can be found um, for teachers on the, on the website. And I think that's really been um, instrumental in making the in implementation just a, a little bit smoother for folks. Um, I would love to turn that over to you and have you talk about teachers. Thanks, Dr. Gennaro. Okay. I actually get to do the fun part. So um, you get a little sneak peek into some of our classrooms. Um, this is a video that is from Carrie Waite's first grade classroom. And you will see um, a student led uh, sound correspondence drill, which is um, a daily part of foundations. Just one of the uh, routines that are very effective in daily foundations lessons. In this slide, you can see some students engaged um, with reading in the first grade class, a key component of um, the model is differentiation, which you've heard mentioned already tonight as well. Here, books are matched to students' interests and abilities. Um, this is also a time to apply phonics, fluency, and comprehension skills that have been taught in the whole class. Um, here you can see a small group of students, which is another form of differentiation. Through assessment, teachers can plan targeted practice for students with a similar need by using a common or shared reading activity. Here you can see it's um, they're using um, phonics again in a small group um, to reinforce those skills. Um, to see the progression of workshop to the upper grades, we are switching to Sheila Ilyansky's fifth grade writing class, where her students are learning to write for different purposes. Um, the approach is built on gradual release of responsibility, which is when teachers begin lessons by demonstration. And um, often this includes engaging literature um, for the students to study. Um, then there's some sort of shared practice um, where they're, they're still scaffold to your support and eventually students um, work independently and um, have ownership and investment over their work. I really like that. Um, Sheila included this slide because it has some of her students own accounts um, about writing. Um, particularly, I used to hate writing, but now I will like writing. <laughs> um, and how they learn to add more detail and add more dialogue. Um, in addition to brief direct lessons, the upper grades, um, just like the younger grades, utilize differentiation. So teachers assess student needs and, and then target the instruction. So I think that's really uh, an important piece and I'll turn it back to Dr. Gennaro. Thanks, Danielle, I appreciate it. Um, so areas of strength for ELA, um, certainly the consistent approach that includes explicit and systematic phonics instruction, the rich libraries that are engaging and culturally responsive, as you saw in the picture, the kids love the libraries. Um, screening data that informs student support um, through multiple um, venues um, and teachers 
Um, I can't say enough about the teachers, teachers who are committed um, to the student growth and learning, to their own growth and learning. Um, they want to do right by children, and that is um, so important. Um, areas for growth, and again, I'm, I have a few here for ELA, and then I'll go back and dig in a little bit more after um, we finish with grades. Uh, six through 12. Professional development around effective literacy practices. That's one of the things that I think in implementation um, was a little bit um, rocky at, at some points. We're working very hard this year to correct that with Danielle in this new position to be able to um, really dive into what the teacher's needs are to be able to support their use around um, multiple facets. The day of an elementary teacher is a very jam-packed, busy day of, of changing hats numerous times. They are teaching, as you know, all things. And um, so we're looking at it as however we can lighten their load and, and um, make the instruction uh, more straightforward for them the better. Um, deeper dives are needed into the data that inform and target particularly tier one interventions. Um, and then time for teachers to observe and collaborate. Um, time is, is, seems to be always the thing that we are very short of um, in public education. Grades um, 6 through 12, our resources for 6 through 12 include a variety of texts, traditional novels, short stories, articles, media, um, nonfiction, informative tests. A text rather. Our assessment tools um, at that level, MCAS, PSATs, SATs, and AP exams. Um, some of the good news um, with these exams uh, mentioned, SATs have remained very steady. Um, it, our scores in the upper 500, very steady scores um, over um, a number of years. Our AP Lit and our AP Lang scores are um, wonderful with most students. Um, I think we've got 86% of our students in AP Lang scoring threes to fives and 100% of our students in AP Lit scoring um, threes to fives, which is, is really phenomenal. Um, strengths and growth, growth for our grades six through 12. Um, again, dedicated faculty, um, they collaborate effectively. I was just working with the high school folks today um, and they not only know their own material, they know what's going on next door. They have um, a very strong sense of being able to work together for horizontal alignment, course to course. Um, and, and also vertical alignment, having that understanding. Um, I have tomorrow for PD, I have the middle school teachers and the high school teachers getting together. It's the first time in quite a few years. They said they've all been in the same room and we're very much looking forward to digging into the conversations about vertical articulation. Um, it, it's a great opportunity, particularly for eighth grade teachers and ninth grade teachers to, to speak. Um, there is a strong focus on writing and rhetorical analysis in the district. We are exceeding state um, for meeting and exceeding at every grade level, um, most of those by 10 percentage points and our continued performance on exams. Room for growth at that level. Um, I really would like for us to look at a cohesive study of vocabulary and writing conventions, um, particularly at grades five through eight. And I'll dig into that in just a moment. It's all connected. Um, a curriculum review is, is something that we are in the midst of. Data analysis to inform instruction and support, particularly for grades six and eight. More on that in a second. It is all connected. And 21st century skills, things like using AI um, in ways that are responsible. We don't want it as a replacement, of course, but we understand that in today's work world, AI is very much an important part of what um, uh, workers are doing. And so we want to make sure that, that we're addressing that um, in a way that, that serves our students as they go into the workforce. The student journey is something that I just wanted to, to um, highlight here for us. Um, it was something that we um, felt was really important when we started digging into the data at our leadership team meeting. I wanted to kind of give us a reference point for where students are now, because it's easy sometimes to the day-to-day 
and, and you know, you've got this um, sixth grader in front of you, but to understand the journey of the sixth grader as it relates to time on, on learning that was lost or was um, somehow reduced or somehow compromised. And so I um, just share this with you as a way to just highlight the, the notion that our fourth graders today were kindergartners, that that was a key moment for young readers, young students to, to have lost a few months of school. I can't imagine, I'm so grateful that my children are all in their 20s. I cannot imagine what that must have been like. I know you you know firsthand how challenging it was to, to have a kindergartner, a first grader and a job and try to fill in that role of teacher um, from home with a Zoom class. Um, so I, I just want us to kind of keep this in mind as we go to the next slide. Um, and this is the final slide. I want to just use this opportunity to, to just tell you what I've seen in the few months that I've been here in Braintree, things that I am thinking about for um, my department. And every department is important, but we somehow, we secretly think we're really, really super important because if you can't read, it, it, what can you do, right? So we, we understand and we walk in every day with the understanding of the weight of the responsibility that's on our shoulders for all of the children of Braintree. And so in looking at that, I want to, um, I want to advocate for a few things. I want to advocate for um, an opportunity for us to, to have more data. And one of the things that I've been speaking with Courtney Miller, the math director, um, and I work really well and closely together. One of the things that we both feel strongly about is um, creating some data for grades six, seven, and eight, so that we have a better sense of where are those students? How are they performing? How can we provide them with the supports that they need before we get to the MCAS? And so to that end, we're in um, conversation with Star uh, Renaissance Company to, to see about a free pilot this year for the middle of the year benchmarks and the end of the year benchmarks. They're 30 minutes for each um, portion of the test, but it would provide us with a wealth of information in real time as to where students are. And, and so I think that's really important to have the data. That's one thing. Um, as you're looking at this, um, I, I, I gave you 19, um, the world before, right? And um, looking at at the climb that we're trying to make. And it's of course, across the Commonwealth and across the nation. Um, but you know, the small rebounds that we're making, um, we're not, we're not pre COVID yet. But if you go back to that chart that I had showed you um, just before, and we think about the experience of students, we're, we're doing a couple of things. We're really thinking about not only how do we serve the students K one and two in front of us now, but what is it that's missing for our students in grades four, five, and six that we really need to kind of back up and 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 fill in for them? Um, one of the things that concerns me that it's central to our conversation tomorrow when I have five through twelve English teachers in the room is the work around grade six, seven. Um, we have some dips there. Um, unfortunately, we've got the, the camera in that corner, but what you're not seeing in that um, box there with the where we're covered with the television um, screen is the um, student growth percentile. Now, student growth percentile, you want it to be 50. That is, that's the benchmark for a student has made a year's worth of progress, right? So anything below 50 is of, of great concern to me. Um, I'd like to see it back up where we were before 59, 60s. Uh, that, that really says to me, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Um, so I have some concerns with, with our, our middle school, but it's not just this is not to put blame on a grade in particular. It's it's a it's a um, definitely a trajectory that that students are on that we need to address this. So it's not just addressing it with sixth grade and seventh grade. It's about addressing it with fourth grade and fifth grade. Right. And our third grade scores, as you can see, the kids made a nice rebound back They're 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 on their way. Third grade is is 
they're getting there. Their rebound has, has been decent. And, um, you know, it's our kids in the, the middle there that really need the focus. Um, collaboration time is a very difficult thing for us to find. Time is not something that Braintree has an awful lot of. We have one full professional development day. As you know, I'm preaching to the choir right now, and I do understand the financial implications of adding more professional days um, to the calendar. But um, between the lack of, of days, opportunities for everyone to collaborate, and also um, the shortage of substitute teachers to be able to cover those classes and how we have to get really creative in ways that we, we want people to be together, um, to learn from each other, to have that experience. Um, those are some things that, that I just want to have said that as we move forward, those are things that would make such a huge difference, um, I really believe, in, in the way in which we can make this turnaround. Last slide. Last slide. Okay. okay. Questions or comments from the committee? The chair. Problem, man. Thank you very much for coming. I think this is um, very interesting, um, and I appreciate your transparency with all the data and stuff. And I think, not to sound like a broken record, but um, you know, many of us have said over the couple of years that um, the cuts in reading and writing in the middle schools are you know something that has been a concern and i think that ties in with the with what you're saying right now and i think that we need to focus on um bringing those back those resources back to the middle school thank you thank you any other comments questions i have a question you can't sorry it's only come from the committee does, sorry does the committee understand that the town is using a nationally discredited reading program we can't ask questions during the meeting, just in the beginning. We'll 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 address your questions after the meeting. I'll I'll follow up with you. Okay. Okay. Any any no other questions or comments? No? You wanna yeah, just to make a couple comments. Right. So I mean the reading wars have been in existence since 1950 and more so. And there is scientific evidence that students, particularly at the younger ages, benefit immensely from an explicit phonics phonemic awareness instruction. And I think over the, the last five years, Braintree has moved in that direction by the addition of Hegarty, by the addition of foundations. Uh, Lucy Calkins, um, you know, represented a balanced literacy approach in most of the research indicates that the phonics components of those programs got short, short shrift. They were not emphasized. We are emphasizing that. Uh, in conversations with some of our elementary teachers, you know, conversations with, I've had personally uh, around Lucy Peacock's is, is it too dense? Is it too much work to pull out from those materials what you really want to use with students on a given day? And that's a different problem to solve, and we'll continue to look at it. So we are performing well. It is a slow rebound, as I think Dr. Gennaro mentioned statewide, this this is the pattern that every school district is seeing. But even within that context, we are doing slightly better than most. Those Dibble scores from um, the earlier grades and those star reading uh, growth uh, percentages are what we're looking for. And when Dr. Gennaro talks about wanting to be able to get similar data for grades five, six, seven, and eight, that's so we can, in the moment, make adjustments to make sure that we are reaching those kids. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, in terms of professional development time, that's something we're also, uh, one of the next policy meetings I'll be bringing up to talk about some options related to that. Uh, so we know where the focus needs to be, and we can have a, a myriad of different debates about what is exactly the right formula for students. Most of the, the, the leading experts in the country, I think of Timothy Shanahan, who is part of the National Reading uh, Panel, you know, rejected duality of phonics or balanced literacy. You know, it's what's best for kids. And the analysis of the data, the anecdotal evidence uh, supplied by teachers leads us down that path to make sure that we're giving kids what they need to become effective readers in grades K to three, but then to build upon that. You know, when the conversation is driven towards Mississippi, Mississippi didn't do it overnight. It was 17 years. And after 17 years, they reached the national average scores for those grades. And it, that's not a miracle. You know, we were there a long time beforehand. We want our kids to be excellent readers, to be able to pursue the things that they identify for themselves moving forward. So we need to continue to assess what is the right plan for our students 
And I think we have the, the right type of people to put that plan together. Okay. Stephanie. Okay. I would just like to um, uh, talk again about middle school uh, scores. Um, I find it greatly concerning that you're seeing the scores from 2019 to 2023 uh, more than double uh, in not meeting expectations. Grade six goes from 6% to 17%. Grade seven goes from 6% to 15%. Grade eight um, from 8% to 16%. And we know that um, we cut a writing class, we cut the two remedial reading teachers, uh, we the English connections class, uh, and a math connections class at, at the middle school level. So to me, the middle school uh, was impacted the most severely by those cuts that we uh, had in, um, 2020, um, 2021, and, and the evidence is pretty clear that, um, that, that the consequence is that our students are not, our most vulnerable students are not performing as well as um, they uh, would have performed with those support classes. Um, so, um, uh, there was an article in the Globe about Cambridge having a full recovery, and they invested a lot of money uh, in making sure kids had extra time on tasks and, and, and learning. And I, I, I really would like to see um, some of that extra time for kids to learn. I miss mean, so much time in a school day. But those kids need the extra support classes that were cut. And um, I hope that we can come to some solution over the next year or so uh, to improve those scores. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you both for being here. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other administrative updates, Mr. Lee? Uh, this evening, I have no more administrative updates. Uh, moving on to from the school committee, the student representatives reports. My favorite part of the meeting. I gotta find Sam. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm coming. Oh, Sam is logging in. Yeah. <laughs> Sam zoomed in. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can, Sam. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sorry I'm homesick. I guess that's part of my yeah. update is that illness has been going through Braintree High. Thankfully, she's not here. Yeah. <laughs> feel um, better. Hmm? I said feel better. Go ahead. Thank you. I guess to, to start my update, I'd like to, on behalf of the students, just thank all of the teachers, principals, department heads, and professionals who put together all of the reports from tonight. Uh, just, we wanna let you guys know we appreciate all the effort and research you put into improving our learning. And it it does mean a lot seeing seeing it um, as a student, see the presentations, all the great work you guys put in. Um, as for the rest of my update, most of it revolves around student council and fundraisers. The seniors and juniors are having our upper classic flag football game this week, which was formerly known as Powder Puff. So that's gotten spirit up and is an event that everyone's looking forward to. And then the senior class also recently had a fundraiser at Kidoba, and we raised a couple hundred dollars from that. So we're looking forward to doing uh, more work with them in the future. And then we're also going to have one next week at Foley's Ice Cream Shop on Friday. So I know that's getting colder outside, but come get some ice cream to support our class. Um, aside from that, student council, clubs, and honor societies alike are beginning to collaborate on our yearly holiday events like the Turkey Drive and Adopt-A-Family fundraisers 
where we just all come together to help families in the community enjoy the holiday season. We all pitch in, donate a couple dollars, and then um, it's, it's just a great bonding holiday event for us. So that's pretty much all I have for today, but thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Um, kind of going off what Sam said, we're really grateful that we can hear um, the improvements that are being made to our schools. Um, but I'm going to talk specifically about the clubs that <clears throat> I know I'm involved in. So for our Intrac Club, which is our community service club, we partner up with the Rotary Club every year. And uh, our advisor, Miss Noon, along with the Spanish National Honor Society that both me, Maddie, and Sam are part of. So what we're trying to do, we have a, our latest project. It's called the Pulsera Project, and this kind of goes off their website. But basically, it's a nonprofit that educates, empowers, and connects Central American artists with students in more than 3,600 U.S. schools through the sale of colorful um, hand-woven bracelets called Pulsera. So what we do is we get these bracelets. These are handmade from artisans in countries such as Nicaragua, Guatemala, and they have, uh, they make these handmade bracelets, which are actually cool. These are like, you know, truly wonderful. Like um, a lot of hours of dedication go into making these bracelets and they send them um, to the schools across the United States. So we buy their um, bracelets and this year they have handbags too. And with each bracelet comes a tag about, um, with a photo of the person who made the bracelet and kind of their backstory. So what the point of this fundraiser is to, you know, we sell the bracelets and we go get those profits, but those go back to the artists in Central America. So all the hard work, you know, all like the courses we make goes back to them and it really supports them. They, uh, the people who run the nonprofit, they really tell us like every, all their counts towards them helping educate themselves or like, you know, helping their lives. Um, so it's really like a good connection, especially for like our world languages, like as Spanish National Society, we want to work to, you know, really get um, that aspect of like Central American culture into our curriculum and stuff. So this is a great way of doing that. But for Interact Club, our community service club, it's kind of that one project we do every year that connects the international community with our like high school community. So that's kind of what we're doing at Interact Club and Spanish National Honor Society. And then for my next update, it's the National Honor Society. So every year as, um, so this year I'm the vice president of community service for our National Honor Society. And we try to do one group project where we can kind of get all, I think we have like 75 members to do something for the community. And in partnership with uh, Project 351, the nonprofit that I do, we are planning to make bag lunches for people at Father Bill's. So we're trying to, we're hopefully in the next month or so, we're going to get um, donations from our members and we as a board team will go out and buy um, food supplies so like basically we like a sandwich of fruit and chips you know and as NHS we want to make these bag lunches give them to father bills and you know that's our way of interacting with our community so that's the making and then in addition like I think every club is kind of finding their project to get into and uh, truly finding you know how we can help out in any way or so now that everyone's kind of settled down so that's yeah those are my updates <laughs> so kind of piggybacking off of what Sam and Anika have both said it, it is really nice to see all of our teachers faculty members here tonight that have put together these presentations and um, really advocate for our learning it's amazing to see and also with the Pulsera project we have like a Q&A sort of thing with some of the um, heads of the project this via a zoom call which i'm super excited for um and for my update as we enter the end of the term there's a lot of things happening especially seniors are really busy with all their college applications but we still had a time to put together one of an event that i'm pretty proud of that we got to do that superintendent lee touched on in the beginning the um mayoral and, and school committee forums that we hosted the national honor society and some students from the at government course got to kind of put that all together. It was a lot of fun. A lot of weeks went into it. We got to, you know, get out the giant sticky notes and just put out all the ideas, things that were we wanted to know about and kind of just consolidate all of those ideas and really ask about what we wanted to know about. It was a great day, um, both of them. And we wanted to thank all of the candidates for their time in both of those days. And it was a really great opportunity for um, a ton of students to get involved. We had students from like sociology classes, psychology classes, and other history courses come and watch. So even if you weren't involved in like formulating the questions, you still got to be involved. And it was a great um, example of civic engagement in this time of local elections. So it's a lot of fun. Great. Thank you. What, where will you be selling your jewelry? 
Oh, sorry. So we're saying that in school, we're trying to get them into like PTO meetings, like for, you know, like how the elementary schools have some PTO meetings. And so parent teacher conference. Yeah. Yes, we're we are. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. There's also handbags too. Oh yeah. <laughs> so. Because it would make good Christmas gifts, right? I know. True. Yeah, so okay. like wonderful bracelets. Like, uh, you know, and it's really nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Said handbags, you said, huh? Yeah. Yeah. There's too. like bags and there's bracelets. What? You can never accessorize. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. All right, moving into policy and education subcommittee. Stuffy. Policy and education subcommittee um, discussed the Massachusetts Association of School Committee policies on fiscal management at our October 18th meeting. Uh, we voted to move the following policies to the full committee for our first reading. Uh, policy DA, fiscal management goals, Policy DB, annual budget, policy DBP, budget planning, and policy DA, authorized signatures. So the first three, DA, DB, and DBD, uh, are just reflect the current practice um, by Braintree, uh, Braintree schools. Uh, DGA would change the number of signatures required on a warrant, decreasing. Uh, the requirement from four members to one uh, to one. Uh, it says the committee will designate by roll call vote a single member responsible for the review and approval of all warrants as correct and approved for payment. So that is really the only change. So we also discussed some other fiscal management and policies, but we decided to wait until after the Braintree Charter um, updates have been published um, to pursue those further. So um, for um, second reading, um, we have um, the consideration for approval of the Title IX policies. Uh, these are policies that extend Braintree's current bullying, harassment, and discrimination policies to the entire school community. Um, uh, policy AC, non-discrimination policy, including harassment and retaliation. ACR, which is the action policy um, associated with that. ACA, non-discrimination on the basis of sex, ACAB, sexual harassment, uh, ACABR, which is the grievance procedure for complaints of sexual harassment under Title IX uh, of the Education Amendments of 1972, and ACA, non-discrimination on the basis of disability, and finally, JICK, which is on harassment of students. No. Did anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Watch one. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions on any of the policies? It's second. It's second reading. So, unless there's any discussion, we're ready to take we're, a vote. Yeah, see if has any questions? I don't see any questions. So. I'd like to file a motion that we accept these um, policies from the uh, second reading, which would be. Um, policy AC, ACR, ACA, ACAB, ACABR, ACE, and JICK. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve all of the second, all of the, all of the uh, policies that are for, I'm not going to rattle them all off again. Yeah. You said that. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you, Ms. Tuffy. And then um, for Braintree Policy BK, the committee will review and vote on the non-binding resolutions proposed by member districts for consideration at the annual meeting of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees on November 9th. Um, uh, I was elected at the last meeting to represent Braintree as the voting delegate. Mr. Lynch will be the opposite, will be the alternate rather. Um, so um, we voted to to bring these forward to the entire school committee um, 
Ms. Heaver, should I just ask for a vote on each one? Is there a recommendation from the from the subcommittee on each one? On the are you yeah, are we going to vote as a? We have uh, we had an issue with uh, five and uh, seven. Um, so I think it'd be easier if I just off and yeah. vote either yes and I can and when we get to ones that we had we had an issue with I can just say what it is. How much are you going to read off? Not much. I <laughs> <Not laughs> yeah. so recommended to oh, add them all. So resolution one is that was my full, question. Is full and stable funding for Metco. These are non-binding. Okay. So all, all those favor? Yes. Okay. I, you have to go I, through. We go through. Do we need to? Do we need to say them? Motion and second. Okay. One. For each point one. Of, point of order. Okay. Sure. So so then I would I would just tell you that the uh, two that we had uh, that we had issues with um, the first one was resolution five mass so mass school building authority. Uh, part one calls on the legislature to remove the $800,000 MSBA cap. However, that cap was increased to $1.2 million by the legislature this year, so that um, we would want that part one amended or, or removed. Uh, part two calls on the MSBA to reinstate the acceler accelerated repair program, which, which we were all in favor of. Uh, and part three calls on the legislature to allow public preschools to be included in the accelerated repair program and core program. So our recommendation for resolution five would be um, uh, to uh, it's important an amendment to uh, correct that eight hundred thousand dollars cap to the one point two million uh, approved by the legislature and approved the rest. The second um, resolution that uh, the committee has some issues with was related to MCAS. Um, we were unable to agree on any amendments to this resolution. Um, the first um, part urges the Massachusetts to develop a wider, more consensus built strategy for an evaluation system. Part two urges the to investigate the extent of biases in MCAS and make those results public. Part three urges the Massachusetts to enact a moratorium on MCAS testing effective immediately. And part four urges uh, Massachusetts to develop an alternative to the high stakes MCAS exams. So, um, uh, two of us will not vote in favor of this, if I'm correct, uh, and one will, but we voted to bring it to the full committee. Um, okay. So, we'll need to take a motion and a second on each one of the resolutions. Right. So, um, so, so for re resolution seven, um, we just go one by one. Mm -hmm. Okay, just go one by one. So, resolution number one: full stable funding for Metco. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. That's a yes. Um, number two is uh, that guiding is investigation and recommend recommendation with transport transportation bidding process. I mean, it's not applicable to us since we have our own. That, is to, that comes from Southeast Invoke Tech, but it, it's to investigate the bidding procedures on school tra transportation providers, and we were all in favor of that. Okay, so resolution number two regarding investigation and recommendation for transport by bidding procedures. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, moving on. Number three, regional transportation. I have a motion for that. I'm going to make some motions. All right. So, so uh, this again is about reimbursement and fees to cover transportation costs in regional school districts. It doesn't apply to Braintree, but it's important statewide. So, I'm going to make a motion to accept uh, 
Resolution three. Okay, I have a motion. Second. Second, Mr. Devon. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's a yes. Resolution four, diversity, equity, and inclusion recommends that all districts adopt the position of DEI coordinator to work towards an anti-racist school system. Motion. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Kovlamia. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. Present. Still passes five, five, one, one. Um, go ahead, continue. And resolution five, uh, we're recommending um, that the committee approve that uh, with an amendment to change the 800,000 to the 1.2 million approved by the legislature this summer. That was done after these resolutions were written. Um, so um, is there a resolution, is there, a, uh, I guess I'll make the motion to accept uh, the MSBA resolutions for number five with the caveat that uh, amendment be made uh, to change the, the MSBA cap. I'll second that. I have a motion by Ms. Tuffy, second by Mr. Devin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's unanimous. Uh, re resolution six is, is talks about school bus stop arms surveillance uh, act uh, enforcement and penalties that would give cities and towns the ability to install video detection systems and increase fines for motorists who fail to stop for a school bus. Motion minus copy. I'll second that. By Mr. Devon. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. And resolution seven related to MCAS is the one that the subcommittee was unable to agree on any amendments to the resolution. Um, uh, I, I, Point of order, Madam Chair. Is this something we might want to table? No, we, oh. this is something that is going to be voted on on Wednesday. Oh boy! And and so these are these are non-binding resolutions, mm. uh, Mr. Devon. So this is this is this gives the uh, Mass Association of School Committees uh, uh their lobbying points when they go and talk to the legislature. Okay, this is so, the importance. So this one was the most controversial. Uh, I felt that. Uh, it was too extreme that uh, that although I don't support MCAS as a graduation requirement, I feel that it, uh, and I feel that the children are over-tested. I do think that the data is very valuable. Um, it can be used diagnostically. So uh, personally, I'm gonna vote no on this one. So I'll present the motion to accept resolution seven. I have a motion by Ms. Cobbleman. I'll second it. I have a second by Mr. Devon. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Aye. So how, what, what were we at? A no. I'm a no. I'm a no. No. You are a yes? yes? No. Yes? No. No. So that one one's failed. That one failed. Five, two. Thank you for the explanation. And finally, uh, resolution uh, eight is safe storage of firearms. This recommends that. Uh, all districts made an appropriate communication to parents and guardians explaining the importance of secure firearms storage. Uh, for example, we discuss uh, the Moms Demand Action Be Smart program. I was uh, uh, an example of um, a program like that. The chair? Yeah, we said that it doesn't affect um, the purchase. It just talks about storage. It's just educating guns to properly store uh, guns at home. That's because it, you know, the school shootings. And so this is just an educational thing. It doesn't affect um, purchase or sales or anything like that. It's just storage. Okay. Madam Chair, I believe there is a law on the books of how to lawfully steer, store your weapon, whether it's in transit. And the laws are rather comprehensive as to what you can and can't do as far as how this on your education. person this is education program. this okay. is education, education. Yeah. education? Yeah. great yeah. okay that motion wouldn't normally i think I it's important to support resolution 
a safe storage of firearms. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. I'm going to Saro second it. Um, I have a motion from Ms. Tuffy, second by Ms. Saros. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Present. That is unanimous. Oh, excuse me. Five, six and one. Okay, so uh, um, that is the eight resolutions that NASC presented this year. Um, and you will bring forth our. Uh... So we we have we voted uh, to amend the one about uh, on the MSUA cap, and uh, we voted no on the MCAS. One, they may come in with amendments that would change that as written and, and that that to make it more palatable. But right now, uh, we, we our committee couldn't agree on any amendments. For okay. you want me to go on to we're going to move on to the evaluation of the subcommittee? Yeah, so the evaluation, um, sub. Subcommittee was approved at our October meeting to clarify and facilitate the process of evaluating the superintendent. Um, have the slides, Mr. So, do you have those slides, Mr. Lee? I'm going to have to pull up. Give me one second. The subcommittee met on uh, October 30th to review the timeline, proposed goals, strategies, and benchmarks for the superintendent's evaluation. Second, please. Through the chair, I'm on it. Um, you said you met the subcommittee met on October thirtieth. Uh, they met on we met on October thirtieth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and was everybody present? Miss uh, Eager, I and I were were committee members, and Mr. Lee was there. Okay, Mr. Lynch was absent. Okay, and that was just one meeting. So yes. far. Okay. Yeah. And I and my I, I have slides to show you yep. the, yeah, the time. Sure. There. Okay, so, um, so the uh, school committee voted unanimously to use the DESI model superintendent evaluation at our April 3rd meeting. Um, the last evaluation, superintendent evaluation was done in 2017-2018 on Dr. Hackett. Um, so this model uh, um, this, this model provides a continuous flow of, of uh, assessment, very much the same as the teachers and um, are evaluated by in, in the schools. Our, um, the timeline will allow the outgoing members to have a chance to review the performance goals we came up with at our meeting for the superintendent. And it will allow new school committee members to review and add to the goal during the formative assessment. And uh, it will allow the school committee members to review the results of the 2024 MCAS data before the final uh, summative evaluation. So, so uh, we set the timeline for um, uh, the self assessment. Mr. Lee provided us with a uh, uh, assessment uh, where he uh, aligned actions to his goals that he wrote for September in September of 22. Um, and we use that uh, to prepare uh, for tonight's meeting. Ongoing 23, 24 would be implementation. And uh, we decided to wait until March to do the formative assessment to give the new committee members a chance to become familiar with the material. And then in September, we'll do the summative evaluation. 
So, um, the superintendents have to identify at least one student learning goal, one professional practice goal, and two uh, to four district improvement goals. The goals should be SMART goals and align to at least one focus indicator from the standards for effective leadership. So you can see the standards here, instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and uh, standard for is professional culture. Underneath those are the focus indicators, which I won't read through. So just to tell you the ones that we picked. Um, so. Uh, it was important for the superintendent to in his schools with um, with uh, the improvement goals for the whole system. So, as his student learning goal, uh, Mr. Lee uh, chose to improve student achievement to narrow the achievement gap between student subgroups, um, and to assess that the progress benchmarks we have uh, K through. Two would be Dibbles, uh, grade three through five, star reading assessment, math assessment. There's. So I'll just, I'll just um, get star assessments. Uh, grades three through 12 would be MCAS. Uh, for professional uh, practice goal to oversee the implementation and progress of the BPS strategic plan. And um, that tonight we had our first step with that, the presentation of the school improvement plans by principals. And uh, we will have another end of the year report this year, uh, which was done at the end of um, last school year and was very informative. District improvement goal. The first one is to prepare the early learning center at the Old South Middle School for kindergarten and pre-kindergarten students. And uh, progress benchmarks would be updates from the school building committee. And of course the building opening on schedule in September, 2024. And finally, district improvement goal would be to, be to continue to adjust the middle school program to meet the needs of all students. And again, uh, reports from building principals, department directors, uh, will help inform our decisions and um, an updated program of studies. Are there any questions on the process or the goals? Seeing none. Do, do we need to vote to accept the uh, superintendent's performance goals? I think we should. Okay, so I'll make a, a motion that we accept this superintendent's performance goals. I'll second that, Madam Chair. I have a motion by Ms. Tuffy and a second by Ms. Devin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you for your work on that, Ms. Tuffy. Thank you. Okay, moving on to finance and operations. Finance and operations, I'll do this really quick. October 18th, we met, we discussed the FY24 special education costs. Ms. Kaufman, our uh, Director of Finance and Operations, provided an overview of the current SPED costs, which have escalated since the pandemic, including out of district placements, SPED transportation, and the need for additional staff within the district for existing programs to support existing programs and, and students. So our next meeting is November 15th, and um, we are also continuing the discussion about how to um, fund the full day K. That's all I have on finance now. At this point, we are going into executive session. Consideration to enter into executive session pursuant to Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to address a grievance filed by the BEA as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the legal position of the school committee as declared by myself. We will not be returning to open meeting. Um, so at this point, <coughs> agenda, we need to close the meeting. Yeah, so um, motion to close the, end the meeting. So move, Madam Chair. Second. Second. Mr. Devon. Aye. Ms. Tuffy. Aye. Mecca Course. Aye. Ms. Solomon. Aye. Ms. Lynch. Aye. Aye. Oh, we have to go into. She needs. Have a good night. Good seeing you guys as always. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good